Welcome to Adventures in Grace. This is Jim Hockaday. Well, we're going to get back into this smaller series, and who knows, maybe it'll grow a little bit in length, that has to do with the one true and only God. Well, we found that out right over there in the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, or Elohim, the one true and only God, created the heavens and the earth. Well, we love these videos because they're helping us to get out of our own way. That's a really big statement right there, one of the greatest keys, and I have to work on that. Everyone does because our habits, routines, the different ways that we do life, the way that we think by mixing and mingling with the world and having a mentality of the world just puts us in the way where we're trying to help God out instead of just letting God do exactly what he said he's going to do, and what he's already done for us. And so, uh, one of the reasons why we do these videos is so that you can see that God wants to get off the pages of the Bible and get into your personal life so that you're literally being conscious of God at all times. You know, when we hear Paul tell us over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, to pray without ceasing, well, what he's saying is, interact with God without ceasing. And how do you interact with him? Well, first and foremost, you can't interact with somebody you're not conscious of, you're not aware of, you don't recognize. You know, somebody walks by, did you see so-and-so? Oh, I didn't see them. Well, what happened right then? Because you didn't recognize them, you had no interaction with them. Otherwise, you would have thought, oh, if I would have seen them, I really wanted to talk with them. I really wanted to have interaction, but I didn't see them. I didn't recognize them. I wasn't aware. So becoming aware of God, and this is what these videos are doing, helping you to become aware of Him, is the first step in what? In God becoming a part of your life where you recognize that there are grace testimonies and grace stories everywhere in your personal life, in everyone's life, for you to experience. Number two, answers to your prayers. Well, they're always going to become easier the more real the person you're praying to is. So it's not just praying to someone that's in a book. It's praying to someone and talking to someone, interacting with someone that you're experiencing all day long. This is what Paul said when he said, live in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. That means become conscious of God at all times. And number three, that you might share those wonderful testimonies with others. So we're going to jump right back into Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 to 30 in the Message Bible, which is our scripture for Adventures in Grace YouTube channel. Hopefully by now, some of you can quote it with me. And it says, And Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father and son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting upon you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Well, we don't share that verse of scripture or passage of scripture ever without it always becoming more of a reality to us, that we really want to hang out with Jesus on a regular basis. Well, we're going to jump back into one true and only God. So, as you know, we've already talked about Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 31. The only thing that you know, if you want a revelation, the only revelation there is, is, is there is a one true and only God, and he is creating everything. In fact, the second chapter of Genesis, the first three verses, it's the same, yet the context is, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, that he finished everything <coughs> that he was to create. Genesis 2, verse 1, 2, and 3, it says, In the day that the Lord God finished. And then in verse 4, I gave it away, it adds another name to Elohim, and that is Jehovah. So now we know that God has finished all that he was to create. 
And when things were finished, he then added another name, which gives us a clue of what happened. The name he added, added is Jehovah. Now, some you know, of the scholars would, of course, pronounce it differently, and that's fine. But for my scholarly brain, I'll just go with what some have said, which is Jehovah. But what it means is the self-existent one who now reveals himself. And that is such an awesome revelation within itself, the self-existent one. So no one created God. He always has been. He always will be. And he's now actively revealing himself, manifesting himself, making himself clearly plain to something. And what would it be? Well... The clues are that the name was changed or added to Elohim when creation was finished, which means the prize of his creation, even according to Psalm chapter 8, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And I consider the heavens, the stars, the moons, what you have created. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you would visit him? You have given him dominion and given him authority over all the works of your hand. Yea, the beasts of the field, the, the, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air. Somebody is praising God in amazement for God's special attention to one part of his creation. And what was that one part? Man. Verse 31 of chapter 1, God finished everything. He said it was very good. And the last being that he created was on the sixth day. He took that whole day to fashion, form, and create the greatest creation of all time called man. Someone in his image and likeness, just like him, a representation and a manifestation of God himself. In other words, someone with the capacity to receive a revelation called, I am the self-existent one from all time, and I now reveal myself to you as the one true and only God. In other words, very simply, God said, hey, Adam, I'm your dad. I created you. I give you purpose. I give you the ability to function. And he breathed Adam into a body. Adam came alive and was staring right at God. I know you think he was staring at the Bible, but that came later. It came during the time where man fell and changed the course of God's design into a sinful design, and now a book was put together from individuals that still experienced in a degree what Adam did in the garden, which was a walking, talking, living relationship with God where God was real to man. And God wrote things that pertained to that subject alone. And things that pertain to that subject have Everything to do with the law that came, the Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices that came through the animals to give man an opportunity to have more of a relationship with God in a very limited degree, and the, the thread of the blood covenant that was woven through the entire Old Testament, and then prophets, kings, and priests that seemed to have some type of of contact with God that was tangible, that led us to the prophetic utterances that brought Jesus upon the face of the earth, who showed us what Adam looked like as the last of the Adams. And he walked with God, and he talked with God, and he so seemingly easily manifested the very presence of God that destroyed the works of the devil. And Jesus was that forerunner of a brand new nation of people, a brand new species to be created called new creatures in Christ. Or later they would be, they would be tagged Christians, Christ-like. We can tell that they've been with Jesus. Believers. Those that are changed into the very image of God, once again, where God doesn't just walk with man like he did with Adam in the garden. Now he actually lives and partakes of his very spiritual being where God is with us 24-7. And the greatness of this new covenant is now it's by grace instead of law. So the work that Jesus did freed us from the law that we might walk without 
shame and without condemnation and come right into the presence of God without any fear of being destroyed where we could experience the Father and the Father could experience us. And that kind of sounds like Jesus' prayer. No one knows the Son like the Father, nor the Father like the Son, but I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you getting this? I know you are. And wow, 10 minutes have already gone by. But we're talking about the one true and only God. And I want to read you something from basically almost 100 years ago. Someone who worked with Dr. John G. Lake, who had a healing home in Spokane, Washington. And of course, we've started ours right here in Castle Rock, Colorado called Healing by Design. What design would that be? Well, the original design. Healing by God's design, which is God's presence, God's ability, God's divine life imparted into a human being. We're, praise the Lord, like a candy bar. The candy bar now is supercharged with God, and it changes the wrapper until it smells just like the candy bar. I know that's a, a weird example, but the truth is when God comes to live in you, now even your, your wrapper, your body is influenced by God who lives in you, and it'll smell just like God. Praise the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Smell the fragrance of God. Those things that are living will live, and those things that are dying will die. I'm telling you, the presence of God is so real, and he's now living in you. But I want to read to you this because it is an acknowledgement of a doctor who did the best that he could do and even gives accolades to those in the medical field that are doing the best that they can do to help in any degree that they can help mankind. Of course, we know today things have become, uh, in a sense, very tainted, as we saw in the last couple of years, where wrong diagnosis and wrong medications and things were being prescribed into the thousands with people and they were not given the chance to recover. But I think you'll like this because this man then comes to meet Jesus, this doctor, and he begins to talk about his experience. Listen to this. It says, it was my privilege many months ago to give a message from this platform. I think the burden of my soul then was along the lines of the stewardship of wealth. And the burden has not left me yet. Somehow I am praying to God for men throughout this country and throughout the world who will present themselves before God to be his stewards. However, as the brother has asked me to say a word, talking about John G. Lake, perhaps it is very far from my mind to say anything today. My soul has been moved so deeply by the testimony, a testimony of a young man who was healed by the power of Jesus Christ. I have never seen such a clinic as I have seen in Brother Lake's healing rooms. I have come up to his healing rooms and talked with them and turning to the ministers, you know the joy I have had and I have put in lots more time with the patients than with the doctor. That is why I have got such joy in my soul and I do not know a disease under the sun that has not been healed under my very eyes since I have been here. That's what we desire in our healing by design to move into these places where there'll not be one sickness or disease that will not die under our hands. Jesus himself commanded us, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That was to the believers and I am a believer. And if you're listening today, I trust that you are as well. He went on to say, I want to say this much. And then some things were mumbled and they didn't catch all the writing there, but I'll go on to the next sentence. It says, but I believe the surgeons are doing lots in the world, mostly in the way of prevention. I think that is the most interesting thing in our work. John B. Murray, who died recently, said that if he had a life to live over again, he would not be a surgeon. For although it is a blessing, yet it is a confession of helplessness. We cannot do anything for the organ we are cutting out, but to keep it from hurting the body in its faulty condition. The best of surgery is the confession of helplessness. And so Dr. Murray said, had I live a life over again, I would not be a surgeon. I would give my life to the study of preventative medic medicine. I have not the time to discuss the whole realm of medicine and surgery. I have been here for several months. I have been away during the past winter. But before this last winter, I spent several months in Spokane and I have been studying this work. I have, had, I have spent a great deal of time in the healing rooms talking with people who come here. Uh, there are to be prayed for. And if there was, and then it doesn't say, and then that sentence isn't, it doesn't make sense. But let's go on to the next paragraph. 
Finally, I said, there is one thing more we ought to do. I am a physician, but I am working under another, the great physician. And I, am, I suggested prayer. Bless God for that scene. The father and mother came in. The hired man came in. The children came in. They all knelt in a circle on the floor, and I knelt in the middle of that circle. Then I offered a brief prayer. I did not have the light I have now. I did not know that it was always God's will to heal the sick. I did not know then, uh, but I did the best I knew. I said, this is my prayer. God, they say the age of miracles has ceased, and I do not believe it. Jesus Christ, you are at the right hand of the Father Almighty. You are living. I know you are. You are just the same as you always were, and you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. This thought comes to me in that connection. Some of the folks say Jesus Christ did miracles to prove his divinity. I do not say he did not. But after I came to Spokane and listened to the teaching here and also waited on God in prayer, I came to the deep, settled conviction it is always God's will to heal the sick, that no imperfection in mind, body, or spirit is in harmony with his will. I want to explain my position. I feel my brethren are doing good in the world. I have to admit they are doing a little harm too. I will use an illustration to explain. Sometimes we want to take a toy or something that is dangerous away from our little one. If I simply walk up and took hold of that thing and tried to pull it away, I might have difficulty. But when I hold up before her little eye something that is still brighter and more attractive, I have no difficulty at all. She immediately hands over the thing I wanted her to leave. That is the way I feel about medicine and surgery. It is not that I do not appreciate what brethren are doing, but then God has given me something better. And when I compare or rather contrast uh, uh, the flow, and then it, it doesn't finish that statement, but it goes on to say, their hands on the sick, 140, and whether I have the gift of healing or not, I can at least claim that promise as often as I have claimed the promise of the Son of God has honored it. In other words, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. She had hardly uttered these words when the Spirit came upon her and she began to speak in tongues and I listened to one of the sweetest messages my soul has ever heard. I cannot give you the message. It is sacred. Much of it was for me personally, but I want to say this. When the sister reached over and put her hands on my shoulder and said, Doctor, this is for you. I was thinking of years gone by and how little I was doing for God and I was bracing my soul for a rebuke. Then these words came. Your many years of faithful service have not been in vain. I do not know that I ever listened to anything that melted my soul as that did. Then a message went on, and through the Christ in you, I will do that which the human physician cannot do. The reason I have given up the medical profession is, and then it doesn't say the rest, but far different experience from what I had as a physician or surgeon. In other words, what he's saying, the reason I gave up medical professions is because I found something greater. The true perspective the work of the medical profession is man's best effort to bring healing to the world. It is man's invention. It is the best arm of flesh can do. It is the best man can do to save himself from the works of the devil, sickness and disease. Like all of man's other efforts to bring satisfaction and salvation to the human race, it circumvents God's method. God's method of healing is a person. Jesus said that he was the way. He is the way of salvation and healing. He paid for both of Calvary. For there went virtue, power out of him, and he healed them all. Luke 6, 19. This is God's only way of healing. He works only through his son. Like Dr. Britton, there are many Christian doctors who have never seen the true light of divine healing. When they do, they will abandon man's method for God's method. You can do no more mix God's way of healing with man's way than you can mix God's way of salvation with man's way of salvation. This is an excerpt, of course, from John G. Lake. So I want to stop right here and just share because our time is gone. This physician is sharing that there were some wonderful things he's experienced as a physician. But once he experienced the one true and only God and the method by which God gives man. In fact, think about it. Once Dr. Luke met Jesus, do you ever see him using or going back to his medical profession? Case closed. Once you experience God, the one true and only God, there's no other way but to lift your hands and give him praise and realize that every healing and every victory is in Christ and Christ alone. Even those that go through medical practices, if they'll reach out their heart and let God finish, touch, change, and correct what man couldn't do, they'll see the power of God through his grace touch their lives. I just want to pray for everybody right now. It's a little different than our normal sessions. 
Father, I just pray under the sound of my voice that everyone listening, that the wonderful, that's it right there. That's it right there. I say that to say the presence of God now flowing into your home, flowing into your body, into your brain cells, into your eyes, releasing what's gone on in your ears for years, setting them free until there's no more pain and no more sound and no more activity, going into the heart, into the, 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 the uh, uh, organs and tissues of your physical body. I see more going into the intestines and into the lungs to bring great strength to the lungs where the oxygen is utilized as it should be. And I see the presence of God going down into the sciatic nerves, down into the legs, down into the muscles, bones, and joints that'll set your legs free and the nerves become normal and the muscles react as they should. And someone's getting up when you couldn't walk and you couldn't stand, but you can now. Oh, write us and tell us the glory of Christ and the wonderful power of the Son of God and the work of the Holy Ghost in your body right now as we pray. We thank the Lord for setting people free God's way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, 21 minutes, it's our longest video we've ever had, but you can go to the video uh, and find it on YouTube at Adventures in Grace and subscribe or go to Jim Hockaday Ministry Facebook page, but definitely find our email on our website, jimhockaday.com, which is J-H-M-I at jimhockaday.com, and let us know your testimonies. God bless you all. We'll see you next time.